Hi, everyone. We're just going to give it about two minutes before we get started and let everyone join the room. Just going to give it about one more minute. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Tom Walker. I'm the Executive Director of Encore Outpatient Services. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar series, DMV Neighbors in Treatment and Recovery, a spotlight on local resources, programs, and expertise. Over the past several months, we've highlighted providers in the DMV region to provide you with insights and resources you can utilize in your practice. We will be conducting these sessions in webinar format. All participant microphones will be muted. During the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions you might have. We will have time for questions at the end of our presentation. Today, we welcome our speaker, Barbara Klein, to speak on the topic, coping with chronic pain. In 1994, Barbara cured her own chronic back pain using Dr. John Sarno's book, Healing Back Pain, The Mind-Body Connection. This experience led her to go to school to become a psychotherapist so she could help others cure themselves of their pain, not just manage it. She has had extensive training in mind-body techniques and is part of a group of dedicated clinicians across the United States and abroad who advocate this approach. She has been featured in a Hagerstown Magazine article entitled No Pain, Big Gain. Barbara graduated summa cum laude from Shepherd University with a concentration in psychology and earned her master's degree from UMB School of Social Work. Please welcome Barbara Klein. All yours, Barbara. Thank you, Karen Treatment Centers, for allowing me to talk with you about a cure for chronic pain. And to thank you, the participants, for caring enough to learn a new way to help your clients get better without surgery or injections or opioids. I want to read an article I found on cbsnews.com. Most of you probably have heard of this, but for some of you who didn't, um, here it is. Drug overdoses killed more Americans last year than the Vietnam War. The opioid epidemic ravaging the United States is taking a grim and growing toll. The latest numbers from the Centers for Degrees, Deg Disease Control and Prevention show that 64,000 people died from drug overdoses in 2016. That's a 21% increase over the year before. Approximately Three-fourths of all drug overdose deaths are now caused by opioids, a class of drug that includes prescription painkillers. Okay, wow. And the Center for Disease Control reported 70,980 projected overdose deaths in 2019, more than the previous record of 70,699 deaths set in 2017. And experts fear the numbers could be even worse this year due, due to the COVID pandemic. And it's not just the younger generation that this is affecting. An AARP bulletin stated that data from CDC reveals just how menacing opioids have been to older Americans. Since the year 2000, deaths, had, deaths from opioids have nearly quadrupled overall. But for people aged 55 and over, the increase has been much greater. <clears throat> With the CDC issuing stricter guidelines for prescribing opioids, we need to provide those suffering from chronic pain a different path to relief. There's a scene in the TV series Mad Men where Don Draper is doubled over with stomach pain. 
His heart is racing, his hands are shaking, beads of sweat cover his brow. He lunges towards his office waste basket and vomits as he reacts to the recent discovery that he's being investigated by the government. And then there's Carol. She bends over to pick up a bag of groceries she is taking to her mother. She feels a sharp twinge in her lower back. She straightens with difficulty. She has too much to do to pay attention to the pain. After working at the office all day, she stops at the supermarket for groceries, picks up the kids from soccer practice, drops them off at home, and makes her way to her mom's. Later that evening, she will fix dinner for her family, go over homework, pay bills, fold the clothes she left in the dryer that morning, and fall into bed exhausted but unable to speak or to sleep. The pain that began as a twinge has now escalated to near agony. She takes some over-the-counter pain pills and makes a mental note to call her doctor to see if she can get something stronger as this over-the-counter drug does not seem to be working. What Carol doesn't realize is that she, like Don, might be having a physiological reaction to emotional distress. So we're kind of dry here. <clears throat> Although it's more readily accepted <clears throat> that stress can cause ulcers and other gastrointestinal ills such as IBS, it is less accepted by patients and doctors alike that chronic pain from other sources often shares the same etiology. In fact, there's no bodily system that is immune to stress. Degenerative disc disease, stenosis, carpal tunnel syndrome, rotator cuff tears, plantar fasciitis, GERD, colitis, tinnitus, dizziness, fibromyalgia, TMJ, are just a few of the diagnoses given to physical symptoms of stress. There was an article in Reader's Digest magazine entitled, Is Your Doctor Out of Date? One of the topics was that of low back pain. The article stated that using MRIs to figure out the cause of the back pain is not feasible as research has shown that herniated discs, arthritis, and other abnormalities found on the images are not what is causing the pain. Furthermore, it was found that surgery to fix the finding does not, in most cases, eliminate the pain. The article also noted the use of epidemiology epidural steroids as being overprescribed with little, if any, improvement. In his book, Healing Back Pain, The Mind-Body Connection, Dr. John Sarno suggests that 98% of the people in the United States who have chronic back and neck pain actually have what he termed TMS, which stands for tension myositis syndrome, which just means tense muscles. The technical term has evolved into PPD, or psychophysiologic disorders. However, I am going to use the original term, TMS, because it can also mean too much stress. And that's what we're talking about here. Dr. Sarno believed that herniated discs that show up on MRIs or other imaging studies are incidental and not the cause of the severe pain that the patient is experiencing. He believed that physical pain and other symptoms are incidental and not the cause of the severe pain the patient is experiencing. He believed that physical pain and other symptoms can be the mind's way of distracting us from the emotional pain that's too difficult to express or even feel. So now I'm going to have a video uh, showing Dr. Sarno and you can introduce yourself to him. And here we go. Have you ever been stuck? I spent a month on the floor, overwhelmed with stress. So when it finally went completely out and I was screaming on the floor in pain, I called Dr. Sarno. The pain is generated in us when we put ourselves under pressure to be perfect and good. 
I was so bad personally. During a radio show, I had to lay down on the floor. It was such a great barometer of what was going on inside of me. What do you mean psychological? I feel it. You think I'm making this pain up in my arm? I must have spent 15 years of my life in this position. Your body's telling you take a break and let some other person be awesome for a little while. <laughs> There's such a strong cultural mindset that the only legitimate way of treating disease is by giving drugs. You know, my dad was hit by a car and he was killed. Feelings, that's what we're talking about here. I've been creating pain so as not to deal with things. I had diarrhea for six months and it turns out I was just scared shitless. That is one angry foot. I was working four jobs. That was too much, it was too much. And that fury will evoke physical symptomatology as a defense against the rage. I mean, rather than burning down the Capitol, they are turning that anger against themselves. Right? Exactly. Why isn't this being looked at? They say enlightenment isn't in the attaining of truth, it's the removing of lies. I'm talking about life and death. And when I say we, I mean the human race. even finding a way out of this, but it's going to be a long road. Many people say you saved my life. All of this because of one simple idea, the fact that the mind and the body are intimately connected. That's the whole story. This was fun being in your documentary. Okay, let's get back to um, talking about the chronic pain. And um, wasn't it interesting? They actually had a uh, senator, uh, Senator Harkin, and he had shared um, in the rest of the video that uh, he had chronic back pain too and was, uh, was cured by Dr. Sarno's techniques. Um, you can actually see the whole video, it's on demand. And if you just type in um, all the rage and search, you can view the whole video, it's like an hour and a half long. So um, getting back to this, uh, the TMS approach, what Dr. Sarno talked about, focus on, focuses on curing the pain, not managing it. Um, but when I was in a student, um, internship at a local hospital, I asked to sit in on one of the pain management groups run by one of the psychiatrists at the hospital. He told me that people with chronic pain never get better and so we just have to help them manage their pain. When I presented Dr. Sarno's work to him, he became very angry with me and confronted me with my status as only being a student, so how could I tell him what to do after all the years of experience he had dealing with this. Well, I guess he was right in one way. None of his patients were getting better, and I believe some of them have been getting worse due to the group pain management therapy, which, as far as I could see, just reinforced the pain by focusing on it and talking about it during the entire group session. So there is a difference between pain management and using the TMS approach. After verifying that the patient has seen a medical doctor to rule out anything serious, such as cancer or infection or acute fracture, we give the client the knowledge of what is causing the pain and teach them how to get rid of it. We give the client hope and confidence that they can get better. We use various forms of psychotherapy to help them cure themselves. We have them think psychologically, not physically, and to reject the notion that they will harm themselves if they bend the wrong way or lift over 20 pounds, etc. Since they don't have anything physically wrong with them, we don't focus on the physical, except to help get them started to become more active since their pain, <clears throat> once their pain is significantly reduced. Another doctor who, um, he wrote a book called Unlearn Your Pain, Dr. Howard Schubiner, posits that chronic pain is maintained by learned neural pathways in the brain. It was once believed that the brain is hardwired. However, research has shown that these neural pathways 
can be bypassed and new pathways can override the old ones. This research has shown that pain occurs when our brain activates an alarm or danger signal. And what is interesting is that physical and emotional injuries activate the same danger signal, which can trigger pain. When pain occurs, the brain learns that neural pathway associated with the pain. It was also found that people exposed to stressful life events are more likely to have a danger alarm mechanism that is sensitive and activates pain and other symptoms. It is a defense against perceived danger. And that sense of danger can come from childhood traumas, current stressors, or even your personality, personality traits, such as being a perfectionist, being overly responsible, reliable, conscientious people pleasers who don't get their needs met. So nerve pathways that cause the pain can be retrained by understanding what triggers and what amplifies them and can be soothed by a deeper understanding of what is going on with the body and what the body is trying to tell us. Nerve pathways can be rewired by techniques learned in this presentation. So I'm gonna do a little review here before I go into assessment and treatment. So in review, research now confirms the brain constructs all pain as a protective mechanism via neural pathways. Stress and repressed emotions activate the danger alarm mechanism and a pain, fear, pain cycle may ensue. A significant proportion of pain is brain induced. MRI findings are often not correlated with pain. Reversal can occur with education, cognitive, behavioral, and affective intervention. I would like to add here that it's very important to be constantly aware that all of these symptoms in your client are unconscious. Your client is not malingering or a hypochondriac or using the pain for secondary gain. They are not knowingly causing the pain. Thus, it is necessary for you to be empathic and supportive. They are truly suffering and need you to guide them with an open mind. So now that we know what causes chronic pain and we educate ourselves, or, or we, we do educate our patient with this information, so it's now it's time to do an assessment. Again, if you're not a medical doctor, you must make sure your client has a medical evaluation. Then they can ask their doctor, do you have evidence that behaving normally would make me worse? Or do you have good evidence to believe that if I were to return to normal life, I would cause irreparable harm to myself? The less a client's symptoms correspond to diagnostic findings and or the less the client's response to treatment accords with expectations, then the more likely it is that psychosocial stress is the correct diagnosis. The diagnostic tools used by TMS therapists include the TMS stress evaluation, an echo map, and an ACE scale. And if anyone would like to have any of these handouts, please email me at kleinbarb at yahoo.com and I'll send them to you. Um, that's Klein with a K, K-L-I-N-E-B-A-R-B at yahoo.com. And I've used these a lot with my clients. So you can begin by telling your clients that you were doing a stress test. The TMS questionnaire or evaluation includes questions about when their symptoms began and what was going on in their lives at the time. It also notes possible childhood stressors and current issues that could be the cause of the pain. We use an echo map to show them where their lives are unbalanced. The A scale in adverse childhood events consists of 10 questions 
relating to traumas that occurred before the age of 18. The more yeses in the scale, the more likely the client's symptoms are TMS. So now we will get into treatment. Since physical interventions rarely fix the pain, what does? The goal of treatment is not to prevent pain from coming, but to alter the way the client responds to it when it does. Reducing fear of the pain decreases the power the pain has over them. So we will tell them that increasing activity might hurt, but it won't harm them. And although it seems too simplistic, Dr. Sarno has found out that knowing that the pain is not coming from something physical is sometimes all it takes to get rid of it. There have been pain sufferers who read Dr. Sarno's books and get relief. He advocates talking to your brain. He posits that getting angry at your brain and telling it you know what's going on will release the power of the mind to create the pain. Educating themselves about the mind-body relationship and reading books by experts on the subject will help your client understand this connection and give them the tools to cure themselves. For example, <clears throat> Being a good person, Carol is carrying on her daily responsibilities without complaint. However, she may be repressing an emotional needs an enormous amount of rage and resentment at having to care for everyone else's needs with little time for her own. Being the kind person that she is, she doesn't allow herself to recognize those negative emotions, so she continu continues to stuff them until they overflow. And the thing is, if Carol doesn't express these feelings through words or tears, she may develop physical symptoms. So, if simply acknowledging the etiology of the pain doesn't get rid of it, the client is urged to look at any imbalance in their lives. One tool clients can use to help identify their energy usage is the echo map. And we just talked about that. Um, they would draw a large circle with their name in the center, then draw smaller circles extending out from it connected to the large circle with straight lines. In each of these extended circles, they would put their names of the acti and the activities or people in their lives that represent where they are giving or receiving energy. Arrows would then be placed on the lines to show in which direction energy is going. In this way, they can see if there is an imbalance between energy in and energy out. Are they giving more than they are receiving? And the answer is usually yes. So, the next stop would be to use problem solving to break down the issues so they're not well over so overwhelming. Can Carol delegate some of her? duties to other family members members can she change the way she thinks about her role in creating the problem asking herself why is what they want more important than what i want can give her a different perspective on the situation setting boundaries and limits will enable her to feel more in control and less stressed learning that it is okay to say no when asked to do something she doesn't want to do will also help her gain control. Identifying cognitive distortions and reframing will also help chronic pain sufferers learn to be more accepting of their rights to take care of their own needs. Challenging their irrational thoughts or cognitive distortions, I must be perfect or no one will like me, or if I don't take care of everyone, I'm a bad person will help them see that taking care of themselves is not being selfish. Reframing using this is disappointing instead of this is terrible can help them tone down their response to daily stressors and the pain. Finding time for themselves and acknowledging their own needs is very important in healing. So more 
more specific to getting rid of the chronic pain or other symptoms, is something called outcome independence. This simply means that encouraging clients to be more active regardless of the outcome. For instance, if your client has not been able to turn her head due to neck pain, you would have her slowly turn her head irregardless of the pain or with the attention, intention of trying to get rid of it. You would remind her that there is nothing structurally wrong with her neck and therefore it might hurt, but it will not harm her. It's not going to make things worse. This is so important because a lot of people with chronic pain will limit their movements or activities due to the fear of causing more damage. Once they acknowledge that the level of pain does not correspond to structural damage, the fear will go away and there will be no more use for the pain. Remember, it's the fear of the pain that keeps it going. Using systematic desensitization is important as this will give your client confidence without scaring him into believing he has hurt himself. Encourage them to take baby steps. If they haven't been able to sit because of their lower back pain, have them sit for 10 minutes in your office. Then give homework for them to do something they used to enjoy doing, even if it was just sitting at the movies. Or for someone with knee pain walking down the street, ask them to walk five minutes the first day while telling themselves, this might hurt, but it won't harm me. Each day they should add five more minutes using outcome independence. They're not walking to decrease the pain. They're just walking because that is a normal thing to do and they are not making things worse. As they continue this exercise, they will become more and more confident that they are not doing damage to their backs, to their knees. It's very important for them to go slowly because progressing too fast might cause them to feel more pain due to conditioning, such as, if I'm not careful, I could re-injure myself, which will then cause more fear. And I have a list of affirmations I uh, usually give to clients that they can read to themselves as they do these activities. And I can send these along to anyone who's interested. So another cognitive exercise is to reframe their pain as something their body is trying to tell them. What needs to be addressed? What is going on psychologically they might be afraid of? What needs to change in their lives? What is making them sad or anxious or worried or conflicted? The pain is trying to get their attention. They need to acknowledge the message their body is trying to send them. As I said before, it's important that they not talk about their pain. If someone asks, how is your back, your shoulder, your stomach, your knee? They should say fine and change the subject. During session, don't allow them to focus on the physical pain. Do not allow them to use the pain scale. We don't want to focus on the physical, only what is underneath it, the psychology of the pain. Do not try to get rid of the pain. There is a saying that says, what we resist persists. We are trying to have them ignore the pain and focus on psychological issues. At home, when they feel the pain, ask them to immediately stop what they're doing and write down what they're feeling emotionally. So if the bomb doesn't get rid of the pain, the patient may need psychodynamic psychotherapy to help them identify the repressed negative emotions that may be maintaining their discomfort. Using the ACE scale, adverse childhood experiences, the client can be shown how the symptoms can correlate with childhood trauma. In most cases, lack of affect awareness is often central to TMS. And this just means that people aren't aware of their feelings. Anger is the main negative emotion that people repress. Ask your client, how do you express your anger? If they say, I don't get angry, they are repressing it. 
The goal is to help your client develop more adaptive defenses and use verbal forms of coping. They need to put their feelings into words instead of sanitizing. You need to help your client identify their emotions, to experience and admit to their feelings, and to let them know that feelings are just feelings. They're not facts. I had a client who said she never got angry. While exploring this, she told me of an incident that happened when she was very young. Although she did not consciously remember this, her mother told her about it. My client was pushing a toy baby stroller and ran into a wire fence. She couldn't get the stroller unstuck and became very frustrated. Her mother was standing nearby and my client turned from the stroller and began hitting her mother with her fists. Her mother grabbed her and spanked her and was proud of herself that her client my client never did that again. So what did the little girl learn? Did she learn how to dislodge the stroller? No. Did she learn to never hit her mother again? Probably. But she also learned that it is not safe to express your anger. So later on, when she became angry, she would repress this anger immediately and develop symptoms. Again, this is all unconscious. She never did remember feeling angry. And sometimes it's not just the feeling itself that is causing the problem, but how the client feels about the feeling. For example, Carol might say, I feel so guilty for feeling angry and resentful at my mother. Or a sole breadwinner might reveal, I'm so ashamed of being angry at my family for having to go to a work I hate so that I can support them. Since the pain arises from intolerable emotional states, you would ask your client, if you didn't have the pain, what else would be bothering you? Do they accept the feeling rather than put themselves down for feeling the feeling? Tell them it is okay to have these feelings and to express them in a healthy way. One of the ways to reveal repressed negative emotions is by journaling. You would have your client make three lists. One list would be childhood traumas, one list would be current stressors, and one list would be their personality traits. The next step would be to choose one item from any of the lists and write about that. Ask them to set a timer for 20 minutes and write whatever comes into their mind regardless of spelling or punctuation. They would just write for 20 minutes. Have them do this until they have addressed all, of the, all the items on the list. They are not only to write about what happened, but the emotions they feel about what happened. You would then discuss their writings in session and post process these emotions that might have come up while writing. After this, they can write unsent letters to those in their lives who have hurt them or whom they have hurt. They would then discard these writings as it is important to express the feelings, but not to dwell on them. It is helpful for clients to make a gratitude list and a forgiveness list. It's also important to earn in the journaling, uh, journaling with a reflection, such as, I am relieved to express these feelings, and an affirmation, such as, understanding these issues helps me feel better. If they're reluctant to acknowledge how childhood traumas might have affected them, ask them, how would you feel if you saw a child going through what you went through? And you can also use any kind of trauma work that you've been using and have in your toolbox, as long as it does not focus on physical pain and is emotion focused. You can use therapies such as EMDR, body work, HACOMI, and one that I've used myself is uh, ISTDP, which is Intensive Short Term Dynamic Psychotherapy. Part of ISTDP 
is something called memory reconsolidation. Since memories are known to change through the, through the years, you would help the client change his memory of the trauma. The new memory would override the old one and give them the power to release his emotions to be in control of his adult life. So the steps in using ISTDP is taking the client back to when he first felt that emotion. Have them experience the emotion, which is usually anger. Allowing emotion to be expressed. Experiencing guilt about the emotion. Experiencing sadness and grief. Then learning to forgive. And either love and acceptance or letting go. I used this and it was the most dramatic recovery that I've seen in my practice. Um, um, a young man called me, begging me to see him, even though he lived two hours away. And I was um, getting ready to retire, so I told him I couldn't take him on indefinitely and see him um, every week. So he said he didn't care, he just needed to see someone who believed in TMS, as he had read uh, some of the books, Dr. Sarno's and Dr. Schubiner's books and he understood the concept but he just couldn't get rid of the pain. So I told him I had an opening the next day and um, he drove the two hours to see me and we talked about where his pain was coming from. He told me it first started when he went to work at the same place where his father worked and his father had been giving him a hard time about his um, performance. And so I asked him, well, how did that make you feel? He said, well, it, it made me feel really angry. So then I asked him, can you remember the first time you felt this anger? He said, well, I felt it a lot as a child because my father was very abusive and he used to beat me. And I said, okay, let's go back to them. Can you think of one specific time that this happened and describe it to me? So he said, well, I remember a time when my father came home from work and I was doing something that he disapproved of and he just grabbed me and started hitting me. And I was trying to run away from him and learn up the steps and he just kept grabbing me and pulling me back and just hitting me with his fist. I said, how were you feeling there? He said, I was really, really upset. I said, okay, what would, were you angry? I said, you were upset, but what kind of upset were you? And he said, well, I was really angry. I was just so angry that I felt helpless to do anything about it because he was much bigger than me. So I said, okay, let's take this one step further. What would that anger like to do? Now, you're just imagining this. You're not doing this in reality. What would that anger like to do to your father? He said, well, I'd like to kick him down the steps when he's pulling me. I said, okay, then. Let's visualize this. Visualize him kicking you or you kicking him as he tries to pull you down, pull you down the steps. So... He did this, he said, I'm kicking him and I'm hitting him and he's falling down the stairs. And I said, okay, what are you feeling now? Well, I'm still feeling very angry at him. I said, okay, then what would the anger like to do next? He said, I'm going down the stairs and I'm gonna kick him and I'm gonna hit him until he isn't moving. I said, okay, do that. So he did that. And then he got quiet. And I said, what's happening now? He said, well, he's just lying there. Said, oh, and what do you feel now? I'm really feeling sad and guilty. I said, what does that guilt mean? 
well, I feel guilty because I know he's been under a lot of stress with his job and he's just taking it out on me. And I really didn't want to hurt him, but now he's lying there at the bottom of the stairs and I feel bad. So I said, okay, then what would you like to do next? You felt guilty about this. Can you forgive him? And he went down, he said he went down the long steps, touched his father and held his hand and said, I forgive you, Dad. So, we stopped the therapy. I reminded him that this is just in his imagination, but in doing this, helped him be in control. So then, I got him calmed down because he was very emotional. And he had two hours to drive home. So I asked him to please call me or email me the next day and let me know how he was feeling. And he had told me that he had a um, doctor appointment with a neurosurgeon tomorrow. And I said, please let me know what he says. And um, Let me know how you're feeling. So he left, and um, I waited for his call the next day. The next morning, he didn't call. That afternoon, he didn't call. But that evening, I got an email from him. And it started out saying, I have to tell you, when I left your office and drove home, it was worse, the worst pain I ever had. I thought, oh, gee, okay. So what happened? And he said, well, the next day, for that day, I went to see the neurosurgeon, and I told him everything. And let me back up here a little bit. When he told me that he had the worst pain possible when he was driving home, but he went to bed that night, and the next morning he woke up and he was pain free. But he still kept his appointment with the neurosurgeon, and the neurosurgeon listened to what he had to say, and he told them, told him about his decrease in pain. And so the surgeon said, Well, keep doing what you're doing. I'm not going to do surgery on you if your pain is gone. So this was such an empowering time for him. And he thanked me and I, you know, told him how grateful I was to hear this and that he called me back. But I did tell him that he might need to continue therapy with someone who lived closer by, who specialized in trauma therapy. And uh, he agreed to do that. So that was a, the most dramatic incident that I had of clients getting better. Uh, I've had other clients get better, but they not that fast or not that uh, not that suddenly. So um, he did. He said he would. He said he would call. Um, that he would call someone and try to get um, a new therapist that he would see because just this one time, his cure might not be complete. Something else might come up, which is called, which we call um, a TMS equivalent, where when they're like their back is better, then they might get frozen shoulder. And if their shoulder gets better, then they might get carpal tunnel syndrome. But this, if you continue with a therapist, they could work this out. And since I wasn't going to be available, he said he would do that and find someone close to his home. So 
In closing, I would like to say that I believe it's very important for clients to seek therapy with someone who understands and believes in TMS and how to treat it using the TMS method. One of my clients had been working with a therapist for years and had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and back pain of uncertain etiology. Although they had worked through many traumas, the client still had the physical pain. Since this therapist was unaware of TMS treatment, he wasn't able to arm the client with the truth, the knowledge, even though he was a very good therapist with years of experience. It's my belief that if the therapist ex exhibits any doubt that the pain or TMS equivalent could be caused by something physical and relays that to the client, it can impede progress or cancel it altogether. If the client was seen by a doctor who has ruled out any serious disease and the pain continues, the therapist needs to relay this, that, there's, that it is not due to something structural, to the client 100%. I know of a client who had seen a psychologist for hypnosis or visual imagery for her chronic back pain. The client did not get better because, I believe, the psychologist told her that lack of physical exercise contributed to her back injury and ongoing pain. Although I believe it's possible to incur an injury, I also believe that if the pain becomes chronic, the injury is the trigger that allows TMS to develop and it is no longer the cause. In order to get better, the client needs to eliminate even the tiniest bit of doubt about the cause of his or her condition, and a therapist needs to do the same. So there are two sites that I'd like to recommend on the internet. One is um, tmswiki.org, that's T-I-M-I, W-I-K-I dot org, and it has a wealth of information. There's a um, question and answers. Um, it lists a various therapists who are uh, TMS therapists that you could call, and um, there are free programs on there even to um, that your client could take to if they. Um, wanted to do that. And there's also uh, the PPDA Association, which um, offers research and a lot of other information. There is a site called, if you just Google, thank you, Dr. Sarno. And it has a list of people who have been cured using this approach and pictures of them doing things that they couldn't do before because of their pain. And since I am a previous back pain patient, I put a picture of myself behind the wheel of a car because I couldn't drive a car because the pain was too bad and I couldn't sit. So I put a picture of, of myself in the car. And my story is on uh, March of 2012, if you uh, want to get it there. So, um, There's another video. Oh, the video clip that you saw is called All the Rage, and you can actually um, download that from a, a site on the web. Just Google All the Rage. And then there's another film, um, This Might Hurt, produced by Dr. Howard Schubiner and Alan. who is a um, psychotherapist and owns his own pain clinic in California, Alan Gordon. And This Might Hurt carries and follows people for, I think, three months as they get better. And it actually shows some um, therapy that they used for them. So... Now I'm just going to turn this over to questions 
and uh, let me know where we go from here. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. Just a couple questions that came through while you were talking. Um, really, one asking your take on how this can be intertwined with those who use substances to cope with chronic pain. Is there any additional kind of technique or things to consider with individuals that are using substances to cope with chronic pain? Okay, when, when they cope with chronic pain, that is actually TMS. The, the chronic, when they use the substance, the substance is a defense, just like the pain is a defense. And sometimes when they get over substance abuse, they will develop pain. And so we can just use this same treatment for substance abuse that we use for the pain. Instead of putting pain, put in substance abuse. And it can also be used for depression and anxiety because they're all defenses about feeling those negative feelings. Our mind does, does not want us to feel this painful feeling, so it gives us something else to focus on. It creates something as a distraction from those negative feelings. And a lot of people would say, you mean I want to feel this pain? You know, and it's all unconscious. Unless you've had some very severe mental or emotional pain, it's hard to imagine wanting to have the physical pain. It kind of, kind of reminds me of people who cut. They cut themselves to feel the pain, the physical pain, because they can't tolerate feeling those emotional pains. Does that make sense? It does. I, I'll uh, piggyback on that. So what is your perspective on someone continuing to take medications while they're, you know, working with you or someone else, you know, on this, on these techniques? Do they, should they continue? Do they stop? They can, they can continue until this is really up, up to them and their doctor. But mm -hmm. usually once the client starts getting better, they would just stop them on their own. I do not, since I'm not a doctor, I can't tell them they need to stop their medicine. Fair enough. They will do that. And with their doctor's advice, taper, taper off the medicine. Cause I can just throw, if they stop cold Turkey, I could throw them into some pretty bad um, withdrawal. So right. don't stop taking it right away. Wait until your pain decreases. So as therapy works and there's less yes. perceived need for the medications and you can titrate more easily. Right. Okay. Right. Um, another question that came through was, uh, does this technique work well with all ages? Actually, specifically, um, persons curious about how effective this would be on seniors. Well, I'm a senior and it works for me. Um, in fact, just because um, putting myself out here now. I, I went through a lot of chronic back pain and I was able to help myself and cure myself and got out of it. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not going to come again, that I'm not going to experience that again. In fact, just last month, I started having shoulder pain and I couldn't raise my arm. Something was going on. Um, I, I'm a caretaker for my mom. And um, it was getting stressful. And I just couldn't understand what was going on with my shoulder. Well, then I realized um, my sister had asked me if I would um, um, power wash her back deck for her. And I really didn't want to do that. So, <laughs> and, and I felt angry about that, about thinking about having to do that. And lo and behold, my shoulder froze. But I knew what to do to get out of that so it didn't become chronic. I just talked to my brain and I said, I know what's going on here. I know that this is nothing physical going on. I didn't injure it. I didn't do anything. It just started hurting and froze. And um, 
went over the affirmations and like I said, talked to my brain, said, look, I know what's going on here. There's nothing physical going on. I can get over this and I'm not letting it run my life. So I did that and like within two days, the pain was completely gone. And you know, I could lift my arm and it was fine. And I did go over and, and do the power washing. So, and you know, it happens, you know, and it, it's not like you're cured for good. Um, but the wonderful thing is when it does start, you know what you have to do. And, you know, first, of course, you first rule out the physical and, um, and I, I've done that too. And, uh, but that's scary too, because sometimes I had pain in my knee and um, I went to a doctor and he was saying, oh, well, you're going to need to do this and that, and it's not going to work and you might need surgery and all this. And that just scares you. So I just try to, you know, I'll talk my way out of this. And I did. And that's happened quite a lot. I mean, it's been 20 years since I have, I was down with my back and, um, I was actually partially disabled with it. But when I found Dr. Sarno's book and read it, I just uh, started looking for other things on the internet that could help me. And um, eventually I made a lot of changes in my life. And that's when I went to school to become a therapist so I could help other people. And um, that was the you know, best thing I think I ever did. But um, I was at a job that I hated. And um, so going to school and still working just gave me the out that I needed. Uh, there was something better out there for, for me to get into. So you may not, you know, you could tell the client this, that um, it's the TMS um, imperative where if you have, say you have someone has frozen shoulder and then they, their back starts hurt, hurting. Well, then their frozen shoulder will go away because the back pain was much more disabling than the shoulder pain was and was more effective in keeping, in keeping them from remembering their physical or their emotional pain or even experiencing their emotional pain. And that's what causes this is over time, you build up these emotions that you don't express. And especially with women, we're not allowed to show anger or we would put down, you know, so with Carol that I talked about here, she was doing all this for everyone else. And she was just repressing and repressing, not even being aware of it. And when she finally, you know, people would say, well, you lifted that clothes basket or that bag of groceries to, was too heavy for you. But that's not what happened. That was just the trigger. It finally got to be too much. And all these repressed emotions that she was holding back came out as physical pain because she was such a fine, upstanding, kind person. She could not imagine herself feeling this anger. And that's what it's all about. And then once you do get the pain, like Dr. Schubiner said, it is maintained by the neural pathways. It's like a rut in the road. If you keep running, if you keep if those neuro, neural pathways are being kept because of things you're doing and like what you're telling yourself, like, oh, this pain is so bad. I'm never going to be able to get rid of it. I can't do this. I can't do that. All those negative things just keeps the ruts going in the road and you get deeper and deeper. However, remember neuroplasticity. If you start telling yourself, that there's nothing physically wrong with me. I know what's going on. I'm going to take care of myself, do what I want to do, not just what someone else wants me to do. 
I am as, as valuable as another person. I've got a whole list here of affirmations that here they are to tell you what to do. Um, and it, it works. It really works. And we're just kind of running out of time as well. So I, I appreciate um, thank you for your answer and thank you for, you know, taking the time out of your day to, to provide this presentation and prepare for it. For everyone that um, has joined us today, you know, thank you for being here. Uh, Barbara can be reached at uh, kleinbarb at yahoo.com. That's K-L-I-N-E-B-A-R-B -E at yahoo.com um, for any follow-up. Um, real quick, Barbara, um, are there anything else you want to say about your, what you're doing now, services, anything you would like everyone to know before we go ahead and um, close out for the day? I'm sorry, what was your question? Is there anything else you would like folks to know about your services or what you're providing, um, workshops, anything that you're doing? Uh, right now, no, but if anyone wants me to give another talk, I'd be willing to do it. I had to cut this one back because I had to have a PowerPoint pr presentation that's like for three hours and I have activities that I actually do what well, I was doing in person. But since COVID, you know, we can't do that anymore. So if um, anyone else wants that would have the time to even do the um, do the three hour pre PowerPoint presentation that I have, I'd be open to do that. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us. And, and thank you to everyone else for joining us today. Um, please watch your email for details on our next BMP regional webinar. Uh, in the meantime, I encourage you to register for Karen's Addiction Research Symposium, which is being held as a weekly webinar series beginning next Wednesday. Top researchers from across the country will share their latest research in the field of addiction medicine and treatment. Professionals can earn up to eight AMA PRA category one credits for attending. Uh, I will say I've attended this in past years and it's a, a phenomenal amount of information. And I, I highly recommend um, to sign up. Please visit the web address listed on the screen. Um, also in the meantime, should you need anything at all, please feel free to reach out to myself at Encore Outpatient Services, Mallory Schwartzman at Maryland Addiction Recovery Center, uh, Jess Ayer, who represents Karen Treatment Centers in the state of Maryland, and James Fuentje, who represents Karen uh, in Washington, D.C. and Virginia. Thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon.